Yes, and we are live. Hello, everyone. Just give it a few more seconds for some people to arrive and then we'll start. All right, there are already quite some people here, many people arriving. So it's time to start. Um, good afternoon, welcome to our webinar. First of all, uh, don't worry, uh, only the speakers are visible. We have five speakers today, including myself, and you're also automatically muted. Um, if you want to participate in this event, share your reactions or ask a question, Please use the tabs on the bottom right where you find the tab polls, question, and chat. And then you can interact with us. Um, let me first introduce myself. My name is Leo. I'm the host and moderator here today. And I'm also one of the founders of Amsterdam Standard. And we are a development uh, partner for many tech companies in the Netherlands. And today we organize this session together with the Roos Advocaten and our sister company, Global Orange. And we're very excited uh, about this. And I believe that we have a lot of very relevant and interesting information for you. So first of all, thank you for being here. Um, let me quickly uh, tell you why we organized this webinar today. Uh, since the launch of ChatGPT3 uh, last year in November, uh, we have seen an explosion of AI tools and especially ChatGPT itself showed that the AI revolution is really happening right now. And within our company, many people have been experimenting with ChatGPT since the first days. And we know that AI will change our profession as developers drastically in the next few years. Some people think it will steal their jobs. Uh, we don't think so. We like to embrace everything that's going on in this new technology, and we want to use it in our advantage. But all that experimenting with ChatGPT also immediately triggered many questions. For example, can we just copy paste our own or our client's code to ChatGPT? And who owns the output of Copilot AI, for example, a tool that we will also discuss today? And what will happen with my data if I use it there? Will they, for example, use it to train their models? And those are all very relevant questions that we need to answer first before we can actually use these tools on production. And that is the reason why we organized this webinar today together with two great subject matter experts from the Rose Advocata and two very experienced people with a technical background from Global Orange and Amsterdam Standard. So first, let our speakers introduce themselves to you. So uh, Laura, please, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, also for the very nice introduction. Uh, my name is Laura, Laura van Gein. I am partner at the Roos Advocaten and I lead the IP section. I'm very happy to be here. ChatGPT, Copilot, very interesting subjects for us. Uh, everyone's talking about it and, uh, well, lots of cool legal implications. Um, my teammate Rome is also in this webinar. So Rome, over to you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Romeo Groenewold. I work with Laura in the IP department of the Roos Advocaten. Uh, before starting at, uh, as a lawyer at the Roos, I taught for a year at Utrecht University, uh, where I also specialized in IP law, and I'm really excited to contribute to the seminar today for all of you. Uh, over to you, Brecht. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brecht Bosker, Chief Technology Officer at Global Orange. I have uh, around 20 years of experience in building digital pro products in a wide range of uh, technologies, businesses uh, and, and types of use. And in the past couple of years, I've also gotten a deep understanding of various um, AI related applications. Um, and today we'll also be looking at the practical use. Over to you, Stepan. Yes. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. My name is Stepan Cieslik. I'm head of engineering at Amsterdam Standard. Uh, into software development for more than 12 years, and I am a big AI fan. Over to you, Leo. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the introductions. So let me first tell you what you will learn today. Um, most of all, we'll show you how you can superpower your development teams with uh, the two tools that we'll discuss today, ChatGPT and Copilot AI. Uh, also, we'll 
tell you a little bit more about the do's, but also the don'ts of those AI tools, because they're not perfect yet. Uh, of course, Laura and Rome will show you, tell you all about the key legal implications of using these tools. And they will give you like a brief course of the basics of IP law, tell you about the future legislation that is coming up, and we'll explain you a little bit about the uh, AI Act or the proposal pending. Um, what you will get today, you will receive uh, afterwards in the upcoming days, our white paper with more legal context about the topics that we discussed. Uh, some of the parts that we discussed today can be uh, very overwhelming. So uh, you have uh, some nice time to read it later on. Uh, a list with some legal essentials that you actually need to check before you start using these AI tools in your workflow and an additional handy list of useful uh, resources. Uh, before we continue to Brecht, um, I first would like to ask you something. So maybe we can look at the polls tab on the bottom uh, where we have a question for you. So what concerns do you have? Sorry, yes. What concerns do you have about using AI like ChatGPT in your development process? Uh, are you mostly concerned about security, data privacy, ethical considerations, and potential bias, how to integrate it with your existing workflows and tools, or training and onboarding or team members, quality concerns, or maybe you don't have concerns at all. So you can add multiple answers if you want. Um, you can just submit your vote right now. Yeah, so. I see that 33% is mostly uh, worried about security and data privacy, 21% about ethical considerations. So that's great. We have a lot of interesting uh, content to share about that in this webinar, and we'll get back to that. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Brecht, can you maybe do a quick introduction about ChatGPT and GitHub GoPilot AI? Absolutely, Leo. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, the topic we talk about today is all the buzz lately, generative AI technologies based on large language models, or LLM as they're also known as. Uh, more specifically, uh, these are models based on the generative pre-trained transformer, that's where the name GPT comes from, are a especially powerful form of uh, language models that can deliver extraordinary results by being designed to analyze natural language input and to respond in a way that mimics human interaction. These models work by having been constructed using huge amounts of human readable, uh, readable text and computer source code. For example, GPT-3, uh, the most current one just before uh, GPT-4 got released, on which both ChatGPT and Copilot are based, was trained on 500 billion input symbols. It's important to note, therefore, that since the model is based on symbols from the past, uh, it's typically not very good at generating valid output for questions related to future events. That is, of course, or maybe even recent events. I would say that that's kind of obvious. Um, to get a feeling for how these models work, it's probably best to think of them uh, like the autocorrect suggestion you may know from your cell phone. A suggestion for next word is made based on what you've typed so far. These models, in principle, work in a very similar way, although they have a much larger knowledge base and the window of context that they look at is much larger. To get things going for this webinar, uh, maybe some fun facts about ChatGPT and Copilot. Uh, one of them is uh, ChatGPT has actually won a prestigious Japanese liter literary award uh, with a poem. Uh, Copilot AI uh, can support developers in multiple programming language and even translate between various languages, meaning developers can be productive in a broader environment potentially. Copilot AI um, also has been known to generate hilarious coding suggestions. For example, if you type make me a sandwich into Copilot AI, it may suggest a code snippet that prints the phrase, I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that, which is obviously a reference to Stanley Kubrick's movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, the picture I included here on the right um, is uh, a reference to uh, the technology finding its way into the legal systems. In this case, the Colombian judge uh, Juan Manuel Padilla asked the AI tool how laws applied in case of an autistic boy's medical funding. 
well, the ruling itself wasn't necessarily so controversial, but the fact that he included his conversation with ChatGPT was not only novel, but quite controversial. I'll now uh, bridge to Laura to discuss the legal aspects of uh, using these tools. Laura, up to you. Thank you, Brecht. Yes, that is quite a um, scary uh, example you uh, referred to there, um, that, that Colombian judge. Um, but, um, uh, well, let's discuss some IP basics first. We will later on also discuss some other legal aspects, but IP aspects, intellectual property law aspects are particularly relevant here. Uh, some disclaimers to begin with. Uh, the, the subject matter is quite complex. Uh, we will keep it high level, but we uh, must use the word, the word probably a lot. So, uh, well, then you can already get used to that. Um, next slide. Um, key takeaways of IP rights are, in the first place, that uh, copyrights are primarily relevant for software. And that is uh, 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 interesting to know because copyrights were, in principle, written for books, art, things like that. And at the moment that copyright came to life, uh, all the legal experts, uh, experts in the world, or at, at, not, at least uh, some uh, uh, legal experts, uh, came together and they, they uh, 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 asked each other, how should we protect software? And uh, they discussed whether it would be suitable for patent law, uh, other types of intellectual property law, and in the end, they um, decided it should be copyrights. Um, so that is why uh, we are basically looking at these types of intellectual property rights. Um, copyrights emerge at the moment of creation. So not only if you are uh, uh, writing a book or making a patent, painting at the moment that you are writing code, these copyrights emerge at that exact moment. No formality is required. Um, another important uh, thing to know about copyrights is that, at least in the EU, the threshold for protection is rather low. Um, so basically, any set of more or less creative choices will qualify for uh, at least some level of copyright protection. Uh, this means, basically, that any line of self-created code uh, shall, in principle, qualify for copyright protection within the EU. Um, an interesting fact that will be relevant in, uh, particularly in relation to ChatGPT and uh, Copilot is that copyrights can only apply to works created by humans. And now it is interesting to look at the next slide. Perhaps um, you already know these pictures. Um, these pictures are actually selfies made by the monkeys that you see. Uh, very cool pictures. They became very famous. Um, how did these uh, pictures uh, emerge? Um, uh, well, they, 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 these pictures were taken because a photographer, David Slater, left his cameras uh, in the woods and he also attached uh, selfie-taking uh, uh, selfie appliances um, uh, in order to enable the, the monkeys to play with his cameras and also to make selfies. Um, well, they, they led to really cool pictures and uh, they were used by everyone, also without permission of David Slater. And he tried to prevent that because he said, hey, that's, uh, that's a violation of my copyright. It's not your picture, it's mine. Um, in the end, uh, this discussion ended up before uh, a judge and in the US, a, uh, a court ruling provides that these pictures did not qualify for copyright protection because the pictures were taken by a monkey. So that is a, uh, well, nice example to remember that uh, copyrights only apply to works created by humans. Uh, it must be noted that some legal experts think otherwise uh, about this and that some exceptions uh, uh, might apply. Um, uh, but the, the main rule um, uh, is important to remember. Well, over to you, Romé. Thank you. Uh, well, we're already on the right slide. Uh, I will uh, talk with you, uh, talk you through some of the legal points that are relevant when using ChatGPT and Copilot. And at some point, I will focus on ChatGPT and Copilot will uh, come back later. Um, so an essential distinction that we need to make here is the distinction between inputs and outputs. 
where input shall in most cases be created by humans. It's the content that you put into the program and output is machine generated. It's what the machine puts out uh, after you put, have put in the input. Uh, input shall also qualify for copyright protection because it is human generated. However, the machine generated output shall in principle not qualify for copyright protection uh, unless specific circumstances apply as we just saw uh, in the, uh, the example with the monkey selfie. So for example, when there's enough human involvement uh, and to go back to the example of the monkey selfie, the photographer tried to show that there was enough human creativity involved since he had set up the camera and the setting in a specific way. Output that is rejected by a human afterwards is also likely to qualify for at least some level of copyright protection. Uh, this is not surprising because as we discussed, the threshold for copyright protection is rather low. So a small change could already establish that there's a sufficient human creativity involved to establish this copyright protection. We can go to the next slide. Thank you. So uh, focus on ChatGPT. Are there legal differences between the free and the paid version? From a legal point, no, no significant differences. You can see on the slide a few minor points where they, they are differences, but from a legal uh, aspect, they, this doesn't matter. Uh, however, there is a difference between the API and the non-API version. Uh, this I will come back to later. Uh, we will take a, a little look at the applicable user terms, which apply to all OpenAI tools, excluding Copilot. So uh, the first uh, part you see here, uh, some clauses that are uh, saying users may not. And some uh, interesting ones I find, users may not use the services in a way that infringes, misappropriates, or violates any person's rights. Uh, also, IP rights fall within the scope of this article. For example, a copyright. Uh, and the last one, users may not represent that output from the services was human generated when it is not. So this clause imposes a certain level of transparency on their users. And then we can go to the next slide. Also a clause in the terms and conditions about the content. I will not read this whole article to you, but as we briefly discuss the main points in the next slide, but I will uh, shortly uh, look at what do we read here. Uh, we read a part that as between the parties and to the extent permitted by applicable law, you own all the input. So the human generated input you own. Subject to your compliance with these terms, OpenAI hereby assigns to you all its rights, title and interest in and to output. So this way you do not have to be afraid that ChatGPT will say, I helped with that output, it's partly mine. Here they say if you comply with the terms, they assign it to you. This means that you can use content for any purpose, including commercial purposes, such as uh, sale or publication. Also, the last thing we see in this clause is that if you comply with these terms, OpenAI may use content, so that is your input and your output, to provide and maintain the services, comply with applicable law and enforce their policies. So here we see that OpenAI will use your content for those purposes, also your inputs. So after this brief overview with some of the legal guidelines when you, uh, for using ChatGPT, oh, this, sorry, I still, <laughs> it's a, a little, little, little summary of these rules, because I think that the clause for the non-legal people is uh, maybe a bit too difficult to comprehend. So what did we see? ChatGPT users retain all rights to their input if applicable, so if it was your input, also, OpenAI does not claim any rights to your output, it is yours. The user is free to use and exploit that output. And further, what did we see? You must be transparent that the output is machine generated. OpenAI says it will not use API content. So there is that difference that I was referring to. They will use non-API content to improve their services, but API content they will not use. And OpenAI may use content, so the non-API content, with regards to both inputs and outputs to provide and maintain its services. So there we see an important difference. And then after the summary and this proof overview, uh, Stefan will now show you how to use ChatGPT when working with code and how to superpower your teams when doing so. Yes, thank you. 
So as I said, I'm quite some time into software development, mostly as regular Python dev, later also as team lead and architect. One thing that all IT projects share in common is that there is always too much work and too little time to do so. So anything that can uh, speed up your work or improve quality of the code or preferably both is highly appreciated. So I've prepared you four examples of how can you use ChatGPT to improve your workflow. Uh, but you must note one thing. AI, at least for now, is mostly effective in repetitive tasks or, that, or ones that are common, like uh, user account creation. Every service has it, so ChatGPT can give you a pretty good example how to do it. Uh, and these examples are ordered in a kind of way that we starting from the best cases and slowly go to more uh, tricky ones. So let's dive into the first example. Uh, in this example, you can see that I'm asking ChatGPT uh, to refactor following code. And this is a snippet from uh, one of the projects. Uh, this is actually a working piece of code. And as I return, I have uh, another piece of code that does the same thing, but in smaller amount of lines, uh, it cuts out some stuff. I also have an explanation what was removed what was replaced and why. Uh, and as you can see, for free, I can have smaller code. And smaller code is always better because <coughs> less bugs. Uh, so for free, you have a gain. Uh, at this step, when the response was generated, you can actually go into more interactive mode and ask for something more, maybe, maybe to uh, add this uh, values copy back if you need it for something or extend the functionality in some way. So there might be some kind of dialogue into this uh, into this improvement. Uh, but that's like simple case because you have a code that's working, you get something else that should work the same. Uh, the second and third uh, example is see what that uh, are very common to case when your team inherits something from, like inherits some code base uh, that might be old, for example, or poorly maintained. Uh, so we can see I'm asking ChatGPT to write me some unit tests for following code. And it is not uncommon that in uh, old code base, there is uh, lots of code that is not tested in any way. And it's also a chore for developers to write these uh, test cases first because it's not enjoyable thing. And second, you need to first understand what this is, what this code is about to write proper test cases. Uh, it's not as repetitive as first example. So the answers you get from uh, ChatGPT, you must verify, you must double check but it's really good starting point for later uh, refactor and code improvements. And ChatGPT actually parses the code for you and explain what's happening here. So you're just uh, a bit faster with that. Third uh, example connected uh, is to explain a piece of code that I'm pasting into the prompt. And as a result, I get a detailed uh, description what is happening in that particular function. So uh, if you have a problem with understanding old code or something you inherited, it is pretty good way of trying out things and understanding what's happening inside. Uh, the result is also good starting point for documentation, right? So you can copy paste this to your uh, team documentation and everyone can gain something from it. Uh, yes, and uh, the example second and third are really good reason to improve your code quality because it takes one excuse away from developers. It's not like it's acceptable to not give tests and documentation if it's so easy to do, right? And the fourth example, which is pretty a bit tricky, is to write code from scratch. 
Mm, this is also an uh, example in model GPT-4, which is now available at paid version. So it takes a little more time to do uh, because it's bigger. Mm, and here I'm, I'm asking to write a Python code to fetch forecasts for Krakow from which I'm calling today. Uh, and as a result, I get pointed where should I uh, ask for API key. It's openweathermap.org, which is great because I didn't know such service even existed in the first place. So if you're pitching a new idea, if you're trying to do something new, ChatGPT might trick you, but it's worth to try a few times asking for a few things and see what prototypes it will give you because in the beginning uh, of development there is this creative stage you need to find a way to do stuff uh, and chat gpt can generate a lot of prototypes you can try out and see what's working what not uh, this is actually pretty common uh, example asking for forecasts so this code uh, you can see is still generating uh, I can tell you already it's working out of the box. I tried this yesterday. All you need to do is replace your API key with uh, what you get by the instruction from ChatGPT. So it's already working uh, application, which is like very small, but still application, which is great um, by itself. Mm. You must remember though, that if you're asking for something that is very innovative or not common, to do, you will probably not get something that works out of the bat. Like if you try to ask for a uh, driver code for Moonlander, probably it's not something you could use safely in anything, but it can point you to the places where you can find your answer. So it's definitely worth trying out uh, what ChatGPT can give you for new, fresh code and projects. Uh, yes, and that's for uh for short examples what chat gpt can do now we need to go back to earth because all these examples have some legal implications we need to actually be aware of but on these i'd like Rome to elaborate more yeah before we we switch to Rome, there's two very interesting questions in the chat um so have you seen them yes okay will you address them or shall i address them after your part uh you can address them okay i'll fill you in yeah. where needed okay so you can oh you can address them yeah yeah but be, will you first discuss the the legal oh, implications yeah, yeah of course yeah. and now we'll look at the questions I'm sorry. exactly i think that's the logical order yeah thank you stefan thank you i'm sorry guys um, so, putting code into ChatGPT or Copilot, which is not your own, that's a legal implication that we're going to look at right now. Um, and I will discuss a couple of principles that are important when you're doing this. Uh, first of all, the author of a computer program is the rights holder to that program. So, the person who wrote it, who wrote the computer program, made it. So, what does it mean to be a rights holder? As a rights holder, you have the exclusive right to do or to authorize certain restricted acts. And then we see a little list. And one that's really important here when using ChatGPT or Copilot is the permanent or temporary production of a computer program. Because when you're putting something in ChatGPT or in Copilot, that can be a temporary reproduction of that computer program, which is a restricted act. Then the third bullet forms the exception on the above mentioned restricted acts. This makes it possible for people who are not a rights holder to perform these restricted acts um, when the exception is applicable. So these are basically the three main uh, rules that you need to remind uh, in this uh, concept. And then we're going to look at the examples that Stefan just uh, spoke with us about. Can we go to the next slide? Perfect. Uh, so first we have the, I think we're starting with the first example, refactoring your own code. If the person who puts the input into the program is the right holder himself, you, uh, you have the exclusive rights to perform those restricted acts that we just saw, such as the reproduction rights. Thus, refactoring your own code is probably okay. As Laura already mentioned, we're going to use a little bit of probably and we don't want to give you uh, a green light on everything. <laughs> 
Then the second example, writing test cases for someone else's code. So in this example, you yourself are not the owner of the code, which means you will need authorization to perform the restricted acts. Entering code in ChatGPT or Codepilot, as we saw, is a form of temporary production and therefore falls under the restricted acts. So not probably okay, you probably need authorization. Then the third example that Stefan spoke with us about was explaining, and there you see it, someone else's code. Again, you are not the owner of this code. You will need authorization to perform the restricted acts. Entering code into ChatGPT, entering code into Copilot is a form of temporary reproduction, falls under the restricted acts. And the last example, generating code from scratch, uh, scratch is comparable with the first example. You yourself are the right holder. You're not using someone else's code and therefore you have the exclusive right to perform this restricted acts that we just saw, such as the reproduction right. So last but not least, probably okay. So after this dive into ChatGPT and the legal implications when using it, Brecht will now tell you more about Copilot. Shall I first address oh, some? Yeah, we, yeah. we can, I, I cannot do all of them. Uh, but I saw two that, that are relevant to, to, to discuss right now. So one uh, very relevant question is, so we should, should not use as an input any data behind NDA agreements, right? Uh, correct. Uh, that is a correct implication. And another very interesting question is, let's say I use JetGPT to generate text on websites. After what percentage Am I not prohibited anymore to tell the user that it's generated by AI? I think you probably meant, am I not prohibited anymore to pretend that I wrote it or that it would be <laughs> human generated? Um, that is a very relevant question because it's at this point very difficult to uh, see whether something was generated by ChatGPT or not. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, within terms of copyright law, there are no safe uh, percentages. Uh, there's also this urban legend that seven differences would be enough to prevent uh, copyright infringements. There is no such rule. So hard to say, but relevant question. Yes, I. Uh... I agree with that. And also, I think we should remember that it's uh, beneficial for everyone online to have some form of transparency. And you would expect the same from the other people uh, online, the, the websites you visit, uh, the text you, re you read. And at some point, we can trust these programs. And it doesn't even matter if uh, they are being used. But I think uh, thinking of the greater good, that, it, that transparency is something that is uh, a positive thing for everyone online. Okay, the other two questions by Edwin and Daniel will try to answer them in the Q&A session by the end of this webinar. Perfect. Um, so we'll come back to that. All right, so let's move on to uh, GitHub Copilot. Uh, Brecht, maybe you can say something about this. Yes, thanks all. It's uh, been uh, quite insightful so far. I think we can skip to the next slide. Um, I've also included uh, four examples, uh, some of them uh, a bit related to what Stepan has been showing, but I also wanted to highlight two different angles where these technologies could lead to and, uh, of course, give it to the legal team to discuss the implications uh, for a team, but also uh, business at large. Uh, the first example will be uh, also a creative process where you, you have a chore, uh, some work to do. Um, you need to generate. Can, can we just go back to the previous slide, please? Yeah. For one second. Uh, you want to, to generate code to solve a, uh, a business problem. Uh, previous slide, please. One second. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, the second one could be uh, you, you have a task at hand, you don't know how to solve a problem, and you just ask it to generate code. But hey, the code uh, contains security issues. Um, the third one actually uh, can go really a long way. I will talk about that in a, in a bit. Code with a bias, and in this case, specifically a racial bias. And the fourth one, uh, not to go out with the downer, will be uh, showing a bit uh, the implications of doing cross-language translations. And now, indeed, I would like to go to the next slide. So, uh, first of all, let's say I'm tasked uh, by the team to... Uh, well, do something. Uh, next slide, I will go uh, in this in an example uh, style. Uh, 
let's say um, we're in need of creating beautiful PDFs. And as this uh, briefing will show, I'm not a designer. Uh, but let's say we want to generate a snippet of Python code that generates a PDF file using A4 paper size uh, with a nice header text in the top right corner of the page. And let's say wishing everyone a happy new year in Swedish. Why not? And um, to spice things up a little bit has an orange reddish line at, along the bottom of the page. So let's see how this goes. Next slide, please. Uh, oh, sorry. I will now yeah, yeah, show the video. I will share the video. Um, so before we dive into it, I hope for me it's still a bit blurred. Uh, yeah, yeah, there we go. So just pause it there for a second. Um, this is the code editor uh, I was using. On the top left, you see the, the input that you would normally use to code. Um, the hash signs and, and the green text um, is comments. So those those are not actual programming language. So human readable text was uh, what you saw on the previous slide. Below that is a header of a Python function. And on the right, you see the output of GitHub Copilot. Uh, at this point, it's synthesizing seven out of 10 solutions. And you already see it came up with a couple of different uh, suggestions. Um, just stopping there for a second, um, the one there the, where the cursor is at, it uh, creates a report with a page size A4 that seems to check a box. It's suggesting to use Helvetica. Fine, no problem there. It says Gott nu Tor. That's a Swedish uh, saying for Happy New Year. It does something with color and it draws a line. Okay, that seems fine so far, but let's see what it can do more. Um, so... Scrolling down a little bit, I see a little bit of different code, um, roughly the same. It, it's apparently using a different uh, library. That's fine. Hey, but we also have a suggestion for an empty function. That doesn't seem really useful. So let's see what else it can do. Uh, one of the things I noticed when using GitHub Copilot um, over the past period is that it's not very uh, predictable um, in, in its behavior. Sometimes it generates useful suggestions. Sometimes it generates uh, completely useless suggestions like empty functions, sometimes plainly wrong. Uh, but the thing that struck me most was the fact that uh, every time you invoke Copilot, the output may be different. So here on the right, uh, you see actually it now also, it says Kuyul and a good new door. It even included uh, Merry Christmas. So I didn't ask for that, but... Uh, Hey, it's creative. Um, but actually, if I now wanted to have the previous suggestion, I lost it. Uh, I'll run it again to see what else it can do. So in a second, invoke it again. You see it starts synthesizing. And even if you don't read Python code, you will see from the structure that it is, um, it's daydreaming a bit. So it, it's coming up with new suggestions all the time. So depending on, on uh, the problem you have at hand, um, the it may be a hit or miss it may be very useful uh but you need really need to keep your wits about so i'm just going to close this one for a second there uh and let's go to the second example so this i would say i didn't test the code but uh from my experience i could say that that would be a pretty nice leg up to uh, towards creating this beautiful pdf with a, a new year's greeting but now on to more serious matters uh, code containing security issues. Uh, security issues uh, are super important also, of course, from a, from a GDPR and, and, and data protection perspective. So let's see, most software systems nowadays uh, handle data. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. I've come up with a, um, a very simple problem, very common actually. Most uh, software systems have some form of database where they store uh, some data, it, quite often emails as well. In this case, in the example MySQL, it's a very well-known open source database system. And uh, I've asked in green in a comment to generate me a function that deletes an email from a table called emails uh, using the MySQL technology. And in this case, using the C program programming language. So if we go to the next slide, um, we will see that uh, this is the output from uh, Copilot. It, it is valid uh, C code, 
Um, but there's actually a couple of issues with them. There's at least two. Uh, if you're a bit tech savvy or you're in this space, you probably will recognize the SQL injection, meaning that uh, if you put in an email address, it will probably work. But if you are, uh, have more nefarious intentions, you could actually wreak havoc on the system. For example, if you would uh, close the quote, you would end the statement and actually say drop table email, which actually is a SQL lingo from remove the whole table, which is obviously not what you want if you just wanted to remove a single email address. But wait, there's more as they uh, tend to say. Um, you see, or maybe not, uh, please one, one second. Could we go back? Um, we've allocated a little bit of space for, for this uh, instruction to uh, the database server. But if I now put in a very long uh, input, I actually might corrupt the memory that was allocated. So I could go over, it, uh, over its boundaries. That's called a buffer overflow. And it's uh, a very well-known attack vector to compromise systems or to crash them, or to gain entry, et cetera. So uh, maybe it was me, maybe I was a bit naive. Uh, so let's see whether we can do better. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so let's see if we can specifically instruct Copilot not to be vulnerable. I could imagine that uh, if I'm an experienced developer, I say, OK, yeah, I need to be aware. I know that these systems are not perfect, so let's do that. So I've asked it generate me a function that de deletes an email from a table called emails using MySQL that isn't suffering from SQL injection. Well, uh, definitely it generated a different function, but unfortunately it still has the SQL injection, but it also still has the buffer overflow. So what does that mean? It means that um, even though I might've gained some speed during development, I've actually, uh, and if I'm not aware of these kind of issues, Especially if there are multiple, you might uh, think you you might think you're a smart guy and and uh, found one of the issues. There may be multiple, so you need to make sure that you have the proper guardrails in place uh, to catch these kind of issues in your code, review tests, etc. So let's go to another example, which um, might have very far-reaching societal um, effects. I, I will I will take over the screen from a previous uh, I'm okay. sure, video. Um, and as you might recall, this is the case where code contains a racial bias. I will just let, wait for a second for the screen to settle. Yeah, here we go. Um, a bit of code for generating statements on policies. In this case, generate statement on topic. Um, and there's a kind of casual headline at the top saying that this is a headline generator for the U.S. Republican Party. For the sake of demonstration, I uh, made it a bit more uh, obvious, putting in uh, skin color as parameters. But as you will see, um, when it's generating the code, there's some things that... Uh, are to be seen here. So if my skin color equals white and their skin color equals black, uh, it says we are the party of freedom. Um, here, what you see, for example, if my skin color equals white, we don't want their skin color people to have something. Um, well, there's there's more examples um, that that it generated. But what you can already see, uh, and I've, I've, it's very easy to also, add, like we had in the PDF example, um, to, to come up with more and more of these kinds of solutions, pretty much any and all of them had these issues. Funnily enough, if you change the, uh, the comment at the top for the Democratic Party, you would get a, well, depending on your political view, a more nuanced view. Uh, but this is uh, clearly very undesirable from the from let's say at first sight perspective but imagine that these systems would be used in a decision support system um, obviously the bias would be in there but maybe even worse if such code would be used in uh, systems that process data that would train uh, new AI systems then these biases uh, might run the risk of multiplying and amplifying biases and especially in in complex systems they're super hard to detect 
Now, quickly on to the uh, last example. And then before I hand over to the legal team, uh, one second, please. Here we go. Uh, this is a very quick example. Uh, again, in the C programming language, I've asked, uh, I've created a bit of code uh, calculating the distance from Earth of various planets. Um, Please forgive me that Pluto is also in there. Uh, Copilot became a bit cheeky when I generated the first time. Uh, it didn't include Pluto. Say, hey, where's Pluto? Say, well, Pluto is a protoplanet, so that's why I didn't include it. It's here, so don't worry. Um, but let's see how it goes. Uh, there's a new plugin called uh, Copilot Labs. It's, uh, it's apparently still in beta, but you can select a bit of code uh, with the various planets. And let's hit that button there on the left. Go to language translation. And let's say I found this, uh, this bit of C code in a drawer and uh, my project is using Python. I see here on the left, translate code into Python. And let's see that what it comes up with. Well, it apparently already has generated for me. So I don't even have to ask. I didn't test that code, but to me, it looks quite a lot like Python code. Um, yep, yeah, could work with that. So what I showed here was a bit of C code, uh, distance from the planet, cross-translating into a different language. Now, I'm super curious what the legal team has to say about these four examples. Over to you. Thank you, Brecht. Super interesting examples. Um, uh, well, if we look at Copilot's user terms, um, we see some interesting things there. And um, uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, uh, part of these, these terms uh, are very comparable to uh, the chat GPT terms. However, there are some differences. Um, I will not read all those clauses out loud. Uh, we will get to the summary later on. Maybe we can move to the next one already that basically uh, highlights the important parts of their privacy statement uh, and if we move to the next slide um, we see the summary here of the the clauses that we just depicted and uh, uh, that is that users retain all rights to both their input and their output. So that is uh, nice to know. Um, and Copilot states that it will not store code snippets and that these snippets are discarded once the suggestion is returned. So that is different actually from ChatGPT because ChatGPT doesn't make such a distinction. Um, however, Copilot AI does uh, state that it will use uses information when you are interacting with the system. Um, uh, from a legal point of view, uh, it is not always, and, and also from a practical point of view, it is not always uh, clear what the boundaries are of code snippets and what the boundaries are of users information. So uh, basically we see here that Copilot AI is also uh, deriving your data when you're using the system to improve their models. And we don't know exactly what they will do with it afterwards. Um, we can move to the next slide. Well, if we go to the uh, uh, specific examples that we just saw, um, if we look uh, at example one, where Brecht showed that you can generate code from human readable text, where he asked the system to create a beautiful PDF with a very spicy uh, line, um, that is probably okay. We, from an IP perspective, we see no issues here, and also from uh, uh, other uh, um, uh, taking into account our legislation, this is a low risk uh, uh, application or low risk. Use. Um, if we go to example two, um, uh, Brecht asked uh, Copilot generate code for me that does this and that. Um, uh, and afterward, he specifically asked the system, oh, please do not make it vulnerable. And still, there were some security issues. Uh, from an IP angle, this is probably okay because we weren't using anybody else's code. Um, uh, but liability wise, well, you can already predict that this is not okay um, and that you should 
well, be very careful when relying on Copilot AI when you uh, are developing code for a client or when you want to use that code for specific uh, applications. Um, example three, well, as you might expect, that is not okay <laughs> for various reasons, not only for ethical reasons, but uh, the use of such a system would in any case violate, violate GDPR um, uh, unless very, very specific uh, circumstances apply. By no means you are allowed to uh, um, uh, uh, process data regarding skin color and decision making on the basis of skin color is, well, um, uh, I don't think that that would be allowed under any means. Uh, another reason why this code would be forbidden and the use thereof is the proposal for the AI Act, and that is European law that we will discuss later on. Um, example four, um, that is a bit more simple. We saw uh, a translation of somebody else's code that would probably acquire authorization of the owner of the code if it's not your own. Um, an important side note here, for example, if you use uh, code that is um, uh, uh, made available under an MIT license uh, that is basically restriction free, you can also uh, um, derive your authorization from that sort of specific restriction free license. So that is, uh, I think, relevant information. Um, if we move to the next slide, we see an overview um, of legislation uh, to come, uh, which is the proposal for an AI Act. Um, this AI Act is, is very elaborate, but uh, a very important aspect of this AI Act is that it basically distinguishes uh, AI applications in four categories, uh, uh, varying from uh, absolutely prohibited to low risk. Um, well, prohibited is prohibited, uh, uh, so that is by no means uh, allowed to use. Um, the, 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 the code with the racial bias would absolutely fall within that category. Uh, but as you can see, there is also a category that uh, uh, um, is not forbidding, forbidden, but is considered high risk. And basically, the more risky a certain AI tool will be, the more uh, requirements will be applicable for both the users, the providers, and the developers. Um, and in short, uh, if you violo violate these obligations, don't comply with that, GDPR-like fines will be uh, uh, or can be imposed if this proposal for the AI Act becomes effective. Um, and GDPR-like fines, I mean like high, high fines that could end up into uh, millions. Um, so that is important information. Uh, next slide, please. A question that is often asked um, at our team members or in, at parties where people discuss these um, uh, new tools offered by OpenAI is what they're doing actually legal? Um, because we just discussed that uh, the temporary reproduction of somebody else's code is a restricted act and that you would basically need authorization. So. Um, taking into account that Copilot and ChatGPT are trained on somebody else's code for a large part, isn't that legal? Wouldn't that be piracy or copyright infringement? Uh, a bunch of people in the US uh, say that it is, and they have filed a class action lawsuit. Um, that is a very interesting uh, um, uh, fact. And if we move to the next slide, um, Yes. Um, it is interesting to note that it's not a coincidence that this class action was filed in the US, because in the EU, a specific uh, data mining, text and data mining exception applies when you want to train your AI models. And uh, this exception was uh, included in uh, the DSM directive basically because there was a strong lobby for this uh, from the AI sector. Um, rights holders can opt out, so they can basically put a reference in their code that says, uh, I do not want my code to be processed by art artificial intelligence. Another requirement is that this 
uh, text and data mining exception will only apply if you can lawfully access the code. Um, but if we look at, at this uh, uh, GitHub Copilot case, um, it is quite likely that in the EU, but not sure yet, but quite likely that Copilot will be able to rely on the text and data mining exception. In the US, there's a whole different uh, uh, game, and there the rule is that one must assess whether um, uh, Copilot uh, or OpenAI can rely on the fair use exception. And that is, well, an, it, 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 it's, it's, it's another test, basically. Um, if we move to the next slide. Um, we see some uh, uh, future developments here that could be relevant. Um, if the, in the US it is ruled that what OpenAI does uh, qualifies as fair use, um, probably the AI uh, sector will flourish more in the US than in the EU, because if it's fair use, uh, uh, you cannot opt out. It is considered fair use to use other people's code to, to train your, your model. Um, but in the EU, although we have this text and data mining exception, uh, software developers can opt out. So uh, that would be very interesting. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, the U.S. court would rule that OpenAI could not rely on fair use, the EU uh, AI sector would flourish more because there would be more freedom here. So it's very interesting uh, what the outcome will be uh, of the U.S. court case. Thanks, Laura. I think that uh, Brecht will just summarize. Uh, yes, learning. next slide. Yeah, yes. over learning. to you, yeah. Brecht. <laughs> Excellent. I will just uh, keep it uh, quite brief. Uh, there's a lot we can say about this, but uh, some some key points um, that we'd like to share with all of you. Um, the, the key takeaway from our experience with these tools is that uh, while they're definitely not perfect, and we've, we've seen some pretty imperfect cases uh, and with definite caveats, we believe it's a transformative technology uh, that will change the way we create and even perhaps think about creating technology for good. Some key points. Um, as we saw in uh, Stepan's case, th these tools can significantly speed up the coding process. Um, uh, if you provide it, you, have, you ask the right question and the tool is actually performing quite well. Uh, similarly, while not 100% accurate, uh, Copilot uh, or ChatGPT can help you improve your code quality by, for example, explaining the code or generating test cases, these chores, as uh, Stepan already mentioned. As we saw in the example of insecure code, these tools are definitely not a replacement for human expertise. While the tools can be helpful, it's important to remember that they are just that, a tool. Make sure you have proper guardrails in place in your process, your tooling, in perhaps uh, your legal frameworks uh, when you start embarking on such a journey. Um, of course, uh, while the results we see at the moment are already quite impressive, the technology is still in its infancy and it's con constantly improving as we go along. So I guess we can expect to see uh, many new features and improvements uh, as they go along. Um, yeah, so in, in fact, the answer to the question, should I use this for my team, uh, is as so often, it depends. Uh, you may encounter, as we saw, situations where the tool doesn't provide useful suggestions or plainly wrong code, uh, or it appears to be acting plain dumb. Um, it's important to be aware of all these limitations uh, and to make sure that you use your own judgment, uh, you as, as a professional, but also as a team and as a business to decide whether you can use the tool and a suggestion and in which cases it may work and may not. Uh, Laura, I would like to, uh, we have one more topic on GDPR, I would like to hand over to you. Thank you. Yeah, there is, uh, and it's basically, uh, it's, it's actually quite funny that we, we mentioned it only in one slide, because a, a huge one more thing is GDPR compliance. Um, that uh, And this issue should raise lots of caution signs in your mind. Um, you must be aware that if you connect with these tools, that uh, a, lo uh, a lot of GDPR uh, risks will arise. And that also the use of uh, OpenAI, of all the data that we put in uh, uh, these tools, uh, probably violates the GDPR. And, uh, well, to, to keep it at high level, there are five... Um, uh, 
principles of the GDPR, and uh, uh, these are data minimization, data security, etc. They are summed up uh, at the bottom left of the slide. And uh, basically, we see that both the use and uh, the providing of these tools is hard to uh, align with these principles. For example, if we take data minimization, um, uh, Oh, uh, uh, um, these tools provided by OpenAI, they thrive by processing huge amounts of data. And you can, of course, uh, entry also personal data in there, and you don't really know what uh, uh, OpenAI will do with it afterwards. They only say that they will improve their models with it, but, well, data min minimization is not complied with. Um, uh, the same applies to fairness and transparency. It's, it's quite vague what they will do with the data. Um, uh, data security will be an issue. Brecht just showed um, how vulnerable the code can be that Copilot generates. So lots of red flags here. And um, well, to, to, to conclude with, with a final remark, uh, also be aware that you might accidentally be sharing data. Uh, while using the systems. Uh, lots of data do not feel as personal data, but can still be online identifiers. But also if you load uh, a CSV file uh, in your editor, this might be accessible for co-pilots. We're not sure because they're quite vague about the way how they use uh, our data. Um, I think we can move to the next slide now. Yeah, thanks, Laura. I think we uh, we are almost there. We're almost by the end of the of the webinar today. So that was very insightful. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience. I think uh, they are all in the questions tab. Um, Laura, can you try to answer Edwin's questions? Yes, let me see. Uh, the output answer is 100% related to the input. The quality of the answer is highly dependent on the quality of the question. Could it be that the question asked is so unique that even the generated answer is also unique and therefore IP is possible? Uh, super uh, cool question because in theory that, that could be the case. Um, and this is basically the argument that David Slater put forward that these monkeys could never have taken these pictures of themselves without his human interference. So yes, theoretically, that's, uh, uh, that is correct. If I may, because there are some uh, technical quirks, quirks to that. Uh, it might be depending on, uh, I think, uh, interpretation, but let's leave it. There is technical thing that you currently cannot, it, I think it is extremely hard to generate the same output with the same input. like. If you even try play with ChatGPT and you paste the same input a few times, it always generates something different. So it yeah, but hard. I don't think that that would affect. It, that probably uh, is relevant for uh, the question of Ruben that says, uh, "How will they know that I use ChatGPT?" That makes it very hard to tell. But I think. Uh, within the perspective whether or not the machine generated output could in theory qualify for copyright protection uh, it doesn't uh, yeah I understand where you're coming from that if uh, chat GPT will always generate a different answer then the human involvement is by any means too limited to qualify yeah that's also an interesting argument, but but I would say from a legal perspective, because it's all new, uh, it's unlikely that any machine generated output would qualify for copyright protection, but theoretically not impossible. Uh, yes, and there is also a very neat thing about recognizing outputs from ChatGPT. For now, it actually is not possible because even at exams, they are feeding questions to ChatGPT and ChatGPT is like getting lawyer degree or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is also a problem for AI researchers itself because they don't want to train their models on output of AI. So I noticed there are some research to be done how to uh, mark those texts in a way that further AI models will be able to recognize it. But I'm not sure how they will do it, but they're working on it. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah. Okay, then we have another question from Daniel. He asked, what happens if somebody inputs my code or other copyright items to the chat without my authorization? Sure, he broke the law, but what can I do about it if the thing already flies in your database? 
Um, yes, true. Um, um, what what in theory you could do is impose an in, or ask a court if, if you can can uh, substantiate all this, eh? and, and and if you can prove that you are the copyright owner and somebody did this, uh, you can ask an injunction for the person who uploaded it in uh, ChatGPT to never do that again, subject to a penalty. And I think it would be logical to also. Uh, um, uh, uh, file a claim against OpenAI and ask them to remove um, your uh, reproductions of your code from their systems. And probably they will say that is not possible. Um, and then we will end up in a new uh, discussion about what you can realistically ask and whether it's uh, their problem, uh, <laughs> whether they cannot delete it or your problem. Um, uh, but it's it's true that and, and that is basically the same with, uh, for example, uh, uh, the, uh, the um, if, if personal data or sensitive information about a company becomes uh, available, yeah, there's you, you, you can go to court, but the damage is already done. Yeah. Thanks. And then we have another question from Adam. He asked, so you can use generated code by ChatGPT to build his uh, SaaS startup, uh, but uh, what if the, uh, the owners or the investors find it important that you own the full IP of the software? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, I think that uh, in this uh, aspect, that a relevance question in, in due diligence uh, transactions uh, will be that uh, uh, usually you have to be transparent about open source uh, components used in, in your software. And I think now you will have to be transparent about which part of your software were machine generated. I think that's going to be a new question. Uh, when uh, possible investors or uh, possible buyers want to assess the worth of your uh, company and your software in particular. Yeah, thanks. And then I guess the last question, because we're already running out of time with almost 10 minutes. It's a question from Gaston. Um, his CEO really wants to move forward and pilot with AI in customer service. And what is your advice on the first steps in this? Um, yeah, I would be transparent here and explain to the customer that uh, all the upsides of, of the use thereof, but well, the customer must be aware that uh, if it's the customer's code, uh, that he uses a certain amount of, uh, he, he loses control uh, uh, of, of certain code when, when you use um, uh, these tools. So you have to be very transparent here. Uh, and I don't think it will be suitable for all cases, maybe when it's really standard code and, and people ask uh, standard questions like, oh, just build me a nice website or um, make me an application and I don't really care if somebody else uh, uh, would, would, would be able to use that code. Perhaps it's very useful. Uh, but for more innovative code, I think um, uh, th the customers will be not so enthusiastic. All right. All right. Um, not sure if that's the complete answer to Gaston's question. No. But I'm Gaston, so I will. Well, I, I admit this could, could also be answered from technical perspective. But I will. Or in customer service, you mean like as a, as a chatbot, for example? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, that's sorry. No oh. Um, yeah. Um, uh, always be transparent because that is that that is already uh, on the basis of other uh, legal legal obligations. Persons uh, need to be aware that they're chatting with a robot and not with a, uh, a human. Um, uh, so transparency would my uh, would would be my first advice. Again. All right. But I also reach out to you, Gaston, to maybe talk about the technical perspective of your question. So. Uh, Thanks a lot. That brings us uh, to the end of our webinar. Uh, big thanks to all the speakers and uh, thank you for all the many people who are participating in here and all the great questions actually. Uh, in the next day, we will receive our white paper. We're still uh, polishing it up a little bit. We wanted to keep some space to uh, add some answers to questions or some feedback that we got. And also we're trying to work in the new changes that ChatGPT4 that was released last week actually brought. Uh, so we're finishing that. You might expect it in one or two days. Um, 
there will be a, a live recording of this uh, webinar uh, immediately live actually after this event on the landing page where you actually went to today. Uh, and we will also share the link to this webinar um, in the white paper and on our socials. So thanks a lot, everyone, for uh, joining. Uh, have a great evening. And uh, we really hope that you found this all very insightful. So thank you a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you, Leo. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.